King of Fighters, Metal Slug, Fatal Fury, Samurai Showdown. These are the iconic names you'll hear time and again when discussing SNK Online. However, what seldom gets the spotlight is SNK's pretty big catalogue of obscure titles, one of which will be the subject of the next instalment in this video series. Welcome to... What the fuck is The Last Blade? When you think of weapons-based SNK fighting games, 9 times out of 10 your mind is immediately going to jump to Samurai Showdown, considering its continued relevance over the years. However, since this series is more about spotlighting lesser known SNK IPs, we're instead talking about its more obscure sister series, The Last Blade. While not technically connected in canon like Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting are, the germ of the games are markedly similar. Or at least, they are as far as I know because I actually haven't played any Sam Show game in any meaningful depth before. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll get round to it someday. But perhaps that's a good thing in this case, as I'll be able to enjoy The Last Blade purely on its own merits without always comparing it to Sam's show. So without any further ado, let's jump into the first game and see what we're working with. Bye. Oh for fuck's sake. Okay, so pretty much the premise for the game is that there are these two worlds, the Land of the Dead, Makai, and the Land of the Living, or Earth. These two realms are separated by the Gate of Hades, which is defended by four gods. The Vermilion Bird Suzuku, the White Tiger Byaku, the Black Tortoise Genbu, and the Blue Dragon Seryu. These gods lived through the bodies of humans who are deemed worthy of inheriting their power. The game's events take place in 1863, where Japan was in an era known as the Bakumatsu, which took place in the final years of the Edo period where the Tokugawa Shogunate ended. Between 1853 and 1867, Japan ended its isolationist foreign policy known as Sokoku, and changed from a feudal Tokugawa Shogunate to the more modern empire of the Meiji government. The major ideological political divide during this period was between the pro-imperial nationalists called- Hey, hey, come on, this is important shit here. Okay, well, long and short of it, Japan started to accept Western cultures and began entering into the affairs of the rest of the world. Some people accepted this and others rejected it, so essentially it was a time of political unrest. Sheesh! I didn't expect to be summarising actual Japanese history in this video. So what does all this crap have to do with The Last Blade? Well, it's used as a vehicle for several character motivations in the game. For example, the main villain of the game, Shinosuke Kagami, one of the previously mentioned avatars of the Four Gods, he is the bird, sees the chaos and divide in Japan and thinks to himself, you know what, fuck these guys, and decides to open the gate of hell for a laugh. And this is what sets the events of the game in motion. The main three characters of the game are Kaede, Moira, and Yuki, three orphans adopted by a legendary warrior known as Gaisei. However, before the events of the game take place, Gaisei is killed by Kagami for standing up to him against his plans to go to see Earth. Gaisei's body is found by Moria, and before he passes, his last wish is for Moria to not tell Kaede or Yuki who killed him, as he believes they would die trying to avenge him. So Moria has the galaxy brain idea to take the blame for killing Gaisei, and runs off on Kaede and Yuki. Anyway, at some point later, Kagami opens the gate of hell and Kaede decides to go out and find out what's going on, and if he avenges his master on the way, well, that's just gonna be some icing on the top. I was dreading a story summary for this game, but honestly, its setting doesn't really impact the story all that much, like I thought it would. I'd like to introduce the other characters as well, because I quite like some of these designs. First up is Hyo Amano. Pretty much all he does is drink sake and fuck the woman of the land, which is probably the best way to spend your life when you live in the bumblefuck 1800s. He doesn't have much to do in the first game, but he gets a little more relevance at the sequel, which we'll get to. Juzo Kanzaki is a big fat dumb jobber who beats you with a club. Lee Reka is a Chinese martial artist who mocks around with fans and fire and shit, pretty evidently based on Jet Li's depiction of Wong Fei Hung in the Once Upon a Time in China movies. Zantetsu is a ninja who is butthurt because Japan thinks ninjas are useless now, so he wants to prove the survivability of his art. And in his ending, you find out that So I'm Jizaji Kisuragi's ancestor! Next is Akari, who I think is one of the coolest and wildest fighting game designs I've seen in a while. She's an Onmyoji, which is basically a kind of sorcerer or medium who can summon all different kinds of yoka to fuck you up. Just look at some of her moves, man, they are insane. You never know what kind of fucked up monstrosity you're gonna see next when you're fighting her. On that same note, there's Okina, who is one of the four god avatars. And if you thought Lucky Globber throwing basketballs at you was unorthodox, this man will beat you to death with his turtle collection. I mean, basketballs are kinda silly, yeah, but I mean, if you get hit in the face with one, that shit hurts. What's stopping me from just punting this guy's fucking turtles into the stratosphere? Not that I would ever do that. Another one of the four gods is Shigen, who I like purely because of his face in the Shinkiro art. Me too, buddy. 
He was petrified by Kagami prior to the events of the game because he was worried he would interfere with his plans. However, he manages to break free and is now fucking bonkers. His right arm has even turned to steel. That's what 10 years of nofap will do to a fella. Next up, there's Washizuka who interrupts your arcade mode run to be like, Oi, oi, you got a license for that samurai sword? You know, because he's a Shinsengumi unit leader. Yeah, uh, you know, it's like kind of being like a police officer. Yeah, okay, no, this is garbage. Let's just wrap this shit up with Shikyo. This guy is a piece of shit who is better off dead. Which is why he dies in his ending and shows up as a zombie in the next game. Whew, so that's the character roster covered. A pretty good cast all round, but uh, I think the most striking character has to be Akari with her boost to the Wars Yokai summons. It's just a really cool idea for a character. So now that I've covered the story and the characters, I can actually get properly into the game itself now. There's two gameplay types in the last played, power and speed, although I'm really not sure which one I should... Offensive orgy mode? Well, I am John Six, so that sounds right up my alley, let me select that. Moving on to the gameplay, I'm a little unsure of how to accurately describe it. I went in thinking it would be similar to Sam Show with an emphasis on careful neutral and big decisive hits, but honestly, you don't go down that quickly and there's a lot more of a focus on combos like KOF or something. It's actually got one of the more advanced combo systems in any of the old arcade SNK games I've played. Like Sam Show, you are actually capable of, you know, killing your opponent, for real. Although the characters don't generally make much note of it, they're just sort of like, oh I killed you. I mean, Yuki keeps talking to me like I'm still alive. The core gameplay is pretty traditional overall, and while there are some unique mechanics like the two grooves, it's pretty simple stuff. That's not a dig against the game at all though, the fun is in the simplicity. My first playthrough was pretty schizophrenic though, I was just sort of desperately mashing to try and figure out my inputs properly. I even managed to transform into a Waken Kaede by accident, which is pretty awesome. But I still got beaten by the turtle guy. Oh, Awaken Kaede? Right, so what's the best way I can describe this? Imagine you're just your normal self, chilling out and then suddenly, you turn into Rock Howard. That's basically what's happening here. It buffs Kaede's moves and turns his projector into the best fucking thing ever. So anyway, toward the end of Kaede's arcade run, we face off against Yuki, who tries to tell him that Moria wasn't Gaisei's murderer. But Kaede is like, ENOUGH! I MUST HEAR IT FROM HIS OWN LIPS! and runs off. When he finds Moria though, he acts like he still thinks Gaisei was killed by him, so I guess he just forgot. And when you beat him, he says, SISTER SAID SO! BROTHER IS EVIL! So yeah, he just was not fucking listening. But anyway, it all seems cleared up now, so Kaede wants to go game end Kagami despite Moria telling him he'll get killed. Turns out Kagami has been busy since opening the Gate of Death, and he's resurrected a legendary deceased warrior to act as his bodyguard while he, I don't know, sits in his castle and drinks wine. Oh damn, is that Haomaru? Oh. That's not Haomaru. That's big Haomaru. This dude is Musashi, and while his attacks do massive damage, it's fairly easy to block his shit and then get in with a combo. Once you beat him, you finally locate Kagami's castle and confront his bitch ass. There's a really cool transition when you get into the final round against Kagami where the stage changes and everything, it's just... Man, these old SNK games, dude. Once you beat him, he's vacuumed into Death Sanus, and there's an odd cutscene where the Blue Dragon is talking to Kaede about having his power, but I mean, we've already been awakening this whole game so far, so I don't know. Maybe this is where the power canonically awakens in him? I'm not sure. But the game ends with Kaede brooding on a cliff, you know, like Hanzo did in World Heroes. But then all his pals show up and they're like, hey man, let's go get some hot wings. And that ends The Last Blade 1 pretty much. So you've been watching the footage so far, and you've probably noticed that I've neglected to mention one of this game's most defining features until now. And that is the fact that this game looks absolutely beautiful. Along with Art of Fighting 3, I believe this series showcases SNK at the absolute top of their game when it comes to sprite art. It's actually fairly hard to kind of talk about this game the way I usually do with these videos because it's pretty much played straight for the most part. There's not much goofy shit I'm able to point out and laugh at. It's just a gorgeously crafted motherfucking fighting game. But you know what? I think I'll save this spiel for the end of the video because we still have an entire other game to look at and I'm expecting that it'll be even better. The Last Blade 2, also known as The Last Last Blade. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Fuck. Subscribe guys. What's really awesome is that this game has received a Code Mystics port just like Garo Mark the Wars So I have a snazzy UI, training mode gallery, all that good shit. And funny story, I actually won the Last Blade 2's Steam port in an official SNK server giveaway just over three years ago as of me writing this and I'm only just now getting around to actually installing it so yeah, sorry about that. And you know, I am a complete shitter for taking so long to get to this game. Because the Last Blade 2 is everything that made the first game awesome and then some. Even if you've never played it, if you're an SNK fan, you probably know this shot of Setsuna from the opening. Badass. So let's jump into the story and new characters. Despite Kaede's efforts in the last game, the prolapse of death refused to close for long and is now open and spitting out evil motherfuckers from hell to cause trouble at an alarming rate. One of those motherfuckers being Koryu, 
who was able to command the powers of the four gods, becoming a fifth himself as the Yellow Dragon. Another evil spirit named Setsuna escaped the gate and possessed the body of a child and caused him to rapidly age or some shit. He knew that in order for the gate to be sealed properly again, the body of a prophesied sealing maiden would be required, and he begins a murder spree across the country in search for them. At some point, Setsuna approaches expert swordsmith Genzo Takane and forces him to forge a blade for him under the spell of some sort of mind control. Over the course of 80 days, Genzo works to create the sword with no sleep or food. The end result is the Yasu Magatsu Hino Tachi, or the Blade of 80 Days Harbored Unwillingly. Satisfied, Setsuna leaves the man bedridden to be found by his daughter, Hibiki. The 80 days of tireless work would eventually take Genzo's life, and Hibiki swore revenge upon Setsuna and set out to find him. A couple days later, Hyo from the first game swaggers up to Genzo's crib looking to get his sword fixed, but instead learns of his death and Hibiki's journey to kill Setsuna. So he also leaves to find Hibiki and talk her down from following such a deadly path. Speaking of Hibiki, she's definitely the standout newcomer from this game and would gain a lot of popularity later on. She's notable for her unique win quotes and endings that change depending on how brutal your gameplay is. If you close rounds with non-fatal blows, she'll have more reserved and shy win quotes and an ending where Hyo convinces her to come back and stay safe with him. But if you kill everyone, she'll start becoming more comfortable with violence and will be more cold and calculated with a different ending to boot. So anyway, Kaede, Yuki and Moria catch wind of Koryu's evil deeds and set out to stop him. But when they confront him, it's revealed that Koryu is actually a resurrected Gaisei. Despite their efforts to reach out to their old master, his mind has been broken by his time being, uh, dead I guess, and they are forced to fight him. Despite him commanding so much power, Kaede and Moria are somehow able to triumph over him for long enough to Gaisei to temporarily regain control of his mind. He laments that he won't be able to watch his disciples grow up, and prompts Kaede to seal the gate before he loses it again. Meanwhile, Yuki is accosted by Setsuna, who identifies her as the Sealing Maiden. Yuki had considered that might be the case as her necklace had begun glowing when the Gate of Death opened, but this sealed the deal. They duel, and Yuki is able to slay Setsuna. She makes her way to meet up with Kaede and the other four gods at the Gate of Hell, and reveals her identity as the Sealing Maiden, sacrificing herself to end the chaos once and for all. The Vanquishing Virgin, huh? You know, if I ever had an alter ego, I think that'd be a pretty good name for it. A good mirror to John's sex, a good reflection. A good evil reflection. And uh, that's pretty much the main story of The Last Blade 2 covered. I'm honestly a big fan of how it managed to weave most of the characters into the main plot, without them all having the same goal like a lot of other fighting games do. Kaede and Moira go to stop Gaisei, Setsuna is out to find and kill Yuki, Hibiki is trying to avenge her father's at Setsuna's hands, etc, etc. But there is also more self-contained stories for other characters as well. The Gate of Hell also brought back Shiko in a zombified state as Mukuro, who is slain once again by Kaori Sonada who is masquerading as a dead brother Kojiro who was murdered by Shikyo when he was sent to investigate him. Yeah, I didn't mention Kojiro before because he's only playable in the PlayStation port of Last Blade 1, but yeah, rest in dicks. Kagami also gets resurrected and seeks atonement for his past transgressions, so he meets up with Shigen and Okina and is all like, uh, sorry for being a dick and stuff, guys. So they all go and help Kaede and Yuki seal the devil's asshole at the end. Shigen actually fucking dies in the process and Kagami becomes kind of like a foster father to his daughter, so... Yeah, maybe the guy isn't so bad after all. Just a shame, you know, you opened the gate in the first place, you prick. Now Kaede's girlfriend is dead. There's a lot of other stuff going on and all that, but I'm not just going to sit here and recount every character's ending to you. Go look them up or just play the game yourself, you lazy piece of shit. Moving on to the gameplay side of things, not a lot has really changed. The game retains its two gameplay styles, the combo system, it's all still here. Although what's interesting is that Kaede is just straight up awakened Kaede all the time now. His post not clarity became his fucking regular state of being. But with the gameplay more or less the same, I think it's finally time to properly appreciate the presentation. But man, where do I even start? This is peak SNK sprite work, up there with Metal Slug, AOF3 and Garo. Not only are the character sprites incredibly intricate, able to do ball with less with incredibly precise and fluid animations, but shit damn we all know it's about these motherfucking stage backgrounds and yes I mean from both the games. The peaceful serenity of Yuki's stage, the hustle bustle of Akari's stage in both the first and second games as well as Hyo's in the first game, the quiet tension of the ship interior, the, 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 the there's no point in me even fucking talking about it, just look at these goddamn stages bro, I'm putting them on screen, all of them. You know I do kinda wonder what is the point in making a 20 minute video all about these games when I could just as easily link you an Imgur file with all these stages in them and get across about the same message. Aside from the artwork being incredible on its own, these stages personalities are accelerated by the series careful use of diegetic audio to truly paint these stages as real, feasible locations. When you're facing off against Washizuka in a quiet village at the dead of night, with only the wind and raindrops breaking the tension, you can feel the weight of this battle in your goddamn bones. And then the reverse is also true, 
when the music kicks in on those important battles and they end up feeling so triumphant and exciting and it's just it really enriches the experience in a way I can't properly articulate because I'm fucking dumb. It's just really well done. All of it. There's a certain air of sophistication, a certain atmosphere that's unique to not only late 90s SNK arcade titles, but especially to The Last Blade. When I was playing through the first game, you know, moving on from Musashi and facing off against Kagami, I was suddenly hit with an influx of memories from my first ever playthrough of Real Bout Special. And no word of a lie, I got this real warm fuzzy feeling from it. It took me right back to the moment where I beat Krauser for the first time in that amazingly put together game. But it was also met with a bit of melancholy as I realized that these games, the tightly put together SNK masterpieces, are a forgotten art. As amazing as some of the modern offerings from the genre are, these classic arcade titles just offer such a transcendent experience to me despite their simplicity and games like this will sadly never be produced again. Time has moved on, but they are timeless all the same. And this is coming from a damn Zuma playing against CPU on an emulator. <laughs> Shit man. If there was ever an argument for fighting games as an art form, The Last Blade is it. But alas, all good things eventually die. And we know how this story goes. Not long after The Last Blade 2 drops, SNK goes bankrupt and all its IPs apart from The King of Fighters effectively die. Well, okay, there was a Neo Geo Pocket Last Blade game released in 2000, but it's just a demaster of the first two games. Mix in a blender. That doesn't mean The Last Blade isn't survived by its characters in several guest appearances though. First off, there was Hibiki repping the series in Capcom vs SNK 2, becoming a fan favourite after appearing on such a grand stage. So much so, that she would appear as a DLC character in Samurai Shodown 2019, where her split personality is maintained depending on your actions just like in The Last Blade 2. Although it's really amped up in this game, Hibiki having fully swallowed the murderous freaking epic black pill, she just shit talks her opponents before the match and is all smiles while cutting out their sternum and stuff. And of course, there were four Last Blade reps in Neo Geo Battle Coliseum in Hadsex Kaede, Moria, Wajizuka, and Akari. I'm particularly happy about Akari being included because of how unique her moveset is, and it's great to see it in an updated sprite style. Not that the jump in quality is as evident as it is with the World Heroes characters, but still. Man, they really need to port this bitch to modern platforms, I've still never had the chance to play it. As for more recent stuff, this is totally from out of left field, but there's an officially licensed The Last Blade webcomic on Tapas, written by Hayden Robel, or Robel, with art by Cocoon Production. And I tried to give it a read, but honestly, I just couldn't get through more than a couple of pages. It wasn't a problem with the writing or art, I mean, it's not god tier amazing stuff, but it's, you know, serviceable considering what I assume was a tight budget and time to produce each art. It's just I fucking hate the webtoon format. For me, a comic is something that you read while shitting on the toilet. You know, that you can wipe your ass with afterwards. Not this endless doom scrolling shit. But yeah, what an odd thing to randomly exist. I, I mean, it's cool. Uh, we need more SNK comics and manga for damn sure. It's just I had no idea this even existed until now. Did they even market it? Apart from that though, this series is comatose, which really sucks. Out of all the more obscure SNK franchises, this one definitely surprises me the most with its status because these are genuinely incredibly high quality titles through and through, no caveats. So yes, they are getting a recommendation from me. Go play these mothers, seriously. I mean, two got a Code Mystics port, what does that tell you? As for a potential revival, I'm not so sure. SNK already has a premier weapons-based fighting game set in old-time Japan, so while gameplay is fundamentally different, Sam Show probably eclipses this franchise's chance at coming back. But you never know, if Garo 2 is a banger, God, please! then they might look at reviving some other dead IPs. But you also need to contend with the fact that these two games are just astronomically high quality and you'd have to meet that bar with a third entry and that kind of pressure is probably pretty daunting. Anyway, that's all I got to say about The Last Blade. I'll see you guys at the Offensive Orgy next week.